to check them out. What's that good for all? Oh, Helen, you are there, correct. Last intimate group tonight, and this is the same thing. Yes, yes, yes. I'll be writing a lot. Helen, your connection to the spirit world is not. I'm just muting her. So. <laughs> Helen, I'm muting you, hun. You sound not good. All right. So yeah, that's that's that that box actually was a gift from Helen, um, who's on the TV here, and she said when we do witchy boot camp at your house place, she'll fly in for us, so she'll come and meet everybody. All righty, good. Let me just send to myself. So. Everybody take a nice little moment. All the yogi <laughs> just do what we do and everybody in between. And in our practice of, of Wicca, we use grounding and centering a lot in every part of magic and every part of ritual that we do. So allow yourself just to become aware of the body space, the heaviness of the body. And visualize roots growing from the base of your spine, like the roots of a beautiful tree growing down into the earth. And especially with every exhale, because the exhale just gets up that little bit deeper. Your roots are going all the way down. And some of the roots are wrapping around beautiful crystal-like structures. And other roots are dipping into hidden pools of wisdom. And still some of those roots are going down, 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 all the way into the golden core of Mother Earth. And if you feel like you've got anything that you're carrying today, any negativity, any worry, any sadness, if you cross about something, just let it drain down those roots all the way down. And Great Mother will take it into the core and burn it in the fire. Just let it go. And even the stuff that's not yours, especially that stuff. Feel your heavy connection to the earth, your grounding, your anchor. And then gently start to bring your awareness to the place behind your belly button. Just a little bit in and a little bit down. And concentrate on a ball of light in that space about the size of a tennis ball or a grapefruit. And as you breathe, the light expands a little bit on the inhale and on the exhale, it contracts a little bit. Inhaling larger, exhaling smaller. For this practice, centering. Now hold your hands slightly up and open in the form of a chalice and visualize spiraling in from the top of your head as a beautiful bright light. You're collecting the light from the sun, the moon, and the stars. The 
the light is pouring in, spiraling like a vortex, like a funnel. And as you're breathing in, it's pouring into your chalice. All the way down, right down into your feet. And all the way up. even spilling over the top of the chalice into the room around us. And please repeat these words. They're cute and it's a fun little chant for sacred space. Sacred space within myself. Sacred space within myself. Earth and air, light and health. Earth and air, light and health. Blessings of the goddess shine. Blessings of the goddess shine. Bringing me thy love divine. Bringing me thy love divine. Whether I am witch, fairy, or elf. Whether I am witch, fairy, or elf. Sacred space I call myself. Sacred space I call myself. And then place your hands over your heart and bring all of the light into your heart space. This is the bridge between heaven and earth. It's your temple and it is the altar of your soul. And when you're ready, take a nice deep breath in and out. You place your hands on the ground. Good. So tell me what you experienced in that visualization. Any parts of the visualization that you resonate with? Oh, that is my resonance. I didn't realize this until recently, but I actually have been struggling with visualization. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been able to do it that well. Mm -hmm. um, and only recently it started. To get better, um, and a lot of the, almost all the time, I don't visualize something, something just comes. Okay. But then, when you spoke about the energy ball, like I, yes. then immediately I got like these circles that went out. And I saw, I don't know from what angle, but everything was still purple, and then like the concentric circles like rippled out. Beautiful, yeah, lovely, yeah. good. So, is your visualization improving? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to do it. In, I feel like um, when I do it or try to visualize it, uh, I'm doing it wrong or something. Like that. There should be more to it or something. Um, because I feel it as like I sense it. And I can um, you know, I lose track or something. Wrong words or what's going on. Uh, now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the visualization is not necessarily the problem, it's the focus. No, I think maintaining, maintaining, maintaining yeah. the focus, I think. Yeah. Okay. It's like it's like switching on and off the movie. Yeah. 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 Yes. All right, good. It's important that I know where this is with you guys because we're going to train these mental faculties later as we start to, you know, the beginning of our of our work is learning all of the the, the external things, the fun things, the toys and the props and the, um, you know, all of that. And then later we go in and we start doing the, the, the magical internal work and uh, honing the powers of the psyche, the, the, the magic. Marek, how's your visualization? I always have more of my words. I think, um, but it really used to be that great until somebody where I give myself permission to have fun with the imagination. Like if I see it kind of, it, it, it's most of the time animated, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very overpowered. Yes. I, I have fun with it. Yeah. So I, I, it's okay, whatever, I, whatever I'm seeing is it right or okay. You yes. know, I'm not judging what I'm seeing or what I'm feeling. Yeah. Um, so I, and also what I've not, I tend to do is I narrate it. It's like almost telling myself that it's like I'm re reading this, reading it to someone. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if that's weird. Yeah. I don't know if that's it's great, it's right. great that you're not trying to judge or analyze it too much because visualization is the faculty of the right brain and analysis is the faculty of the left. 
And so when we try and judge our artistic experience, we get in the way of ourselves, right? So it's like when an artist is truly in the mode of art, whether that's painting or gardening or cooking or whatever it is, um, if they start overanalyzing, yes, there has to be structure. There has to be some rules to the technique of art. So it kind of is a blending of the two. Really what we're doing is we're, we're trying to train both of the parts of our mind, both of the hemispheres to work together. So visualization is a faculty of the right brain, but being able to focus on it is a faculty of the left. And, uh, and it's just to find a little balancing. So even those of you who are practitioners of meditation and yoga, um, visualization is very important for us to learn to be part of it. But in the craft, very big importance. Because when you start learning things like astral projection and magic and manifestation, mm -hmm. all of these things like jewels in the traffic that day, she was just like, oh, done. She saw it and it happened. That, um, that's the power of our visualization skill. So we're really going to hone that. And don't underestimate the power of this. Yeah. So we, what, we, what we think about, we bring up. We want to visualize. Little part of visualization in that, in that practice. Let's just pick it up. I have a problem with visualizing. Because I don't know how to and my biggest thing is that grief that goes down to the ground. Then I just cannot. Is it too abstract? No, I just don't know. I don't know what to do with it. Just don't work with it. Okay. But um, when I do visualization of things, they happen. Yeah. You know, not, not like meditation, like a workshop. Mm. I see the workshop and now it's starting to be bought. That sort of thing is yeah. fantastic. But well, that's what we want. Yeah, but what yeah, is things like meditation and visualization. So I what's must, what's important here? So let me just put it down now. Who has your yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, you're right away. Oh, right. Amazing. Yeah. You're right. Yes. And so we use one. You can visualize. No, no. <laughs> in this house, it's never too creative. It always means as much creative as you want. I mean, that's how you can raise, right? So stick with it. Stick with it. Mm -hmm. Don't get stuck in is it right, is it right? Okay. There's no room for that. Here. Just enjoy it. Have fun with it. Play with it. If it gets a little bit wacky, go there. Okay. I think our world suffers from a lack of uh, a lot of creative energy. We, we're very stuck in, in overanalyzing, judgment, judgment, and not being hard on ourselves, adulting. And there, and, and there, you know, like for instance, you're an accountant, but there is huge creativity that goes into that. So we must not create a lot. <laughs> we must, we must <laughs> think that. that the world is just one or the other, you know, that that maths is just analytical because it's not extremely creative. Um, so, so why I'm asking you all of this is because it's important for us to hear how other people process their internal stuff. You know, when you're a yoga teacher and you sit and guide meditation, you just assume that everyone's on the same page. We don't actually know. Some people are struggling to visualize roots, some are thinking about it, some are on a wild fantasy, um, you know, and so, so, and some people use senses differently. Some are more visual, some are more tactile. So, Khilia might feel energy more than maybe native theory only visualizing, for example. Um, so, so, start to learn what your predominant magical sense is. That's why some people respond in yoga to mantra. Some will respond to asana very well. Some will respond to just sit there and just do it with the midriff. So, so, so train your dominant sense, and then later we must train the other faculties as well. And I'll tell you, I'm going to give you a hint as to why we're doing this. Because it's only going to come much later. 
when we start training the physical senses, then later we start training the astral senses. And that's very cool. That means that what do you call this stuff? Mm -hmm. Like a fairy realm yeah. or like a spirit world. A little bit higher, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, for example, if you have to hear a fairy talk to you or see a fairy, you might not necessarily always see them with blue eyes or hear them with blue ears. You hear them with kind of like an inner feeling or an inner vision. That's that's where it is. The world of magic and the world of imagination, they blur very much. Um, so this is why children can access a lot of that. So we get tonight to discuss altars, and uh, and this is very exciting, very exciting. But before we do, does did anyone read anything about altars this week, or wands, or did any of you do your? Yeah, tell me, <laughs> tell me, share. Someone. I didn't read anything, but I'm making wands for my. And the most beautiful one. Really? Absolutely. Stunning. You said that's so good. Yeah. They are beautiful. Gems and paintings. Yeah. <laughs> they are stunning. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, actually, post your prices on the group. You got to turn on the crystal again. I think you can. <laughs> you choose the right one. Yeah, okay. Ones. Okay, so Sharma maybe will have a wand making workshop for us oh, okay. um, at the farm, maybe, when we're there. And you can. I know I can charge them. I think I'm giving that out. I'm giving them Great. You're 10 million steps ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So what is a one? What is a one? There's no one stuff in there, so don't lie. That came from inside you. <laughs> Good. So tell us, uh, tell us what you think or feel a one is for, Sarah. For me, I like to use a It helps you too. Please leave. <laughs> you you passed one of the exams and you know. <laughs> well, come and sit here. <laughs> You're too good. Thank you, Stardom. You're beautiful. Yes. So a wand is a tool of focus. So I'm going to come to the ones now. Marika, what did you read up on? So I lost my English work, my book of shadows, mm -hmm. and I studied with material and everything was stolen out of my car. So someone's sitting with all my study stuff and I have a very bitter taste in my mouth. So I um, I'm in the process of, of restarting the whole thing from the beginning. So I went into altars and then I was just studying book of shadows and then I ran out of with my shower to do that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. What did you find out all the way? An altar and a shrine is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Both are different. So the altar is where you do your magic work, right? And then your shrine is where you devote to the deity or the praise or the chant or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Good. So most of you, I know all of you very well, so some of you have next thing. Um, most of you have shrines at home. You might not even know that it's a shrine. A shrine is a collection of sacred things that mean a lot to you. Beautiful things that just make you feel special or make you feel loved or make you remember good things. So, a shrine might be um, love letters that someone has given you or your granny's loves and the family Bible and 
cripple that someone gave you, gave you as a gift and a fairy statue. And so a shrine has no rules to it. A shrine is a place where you really, through physical objects, connect to something big and beautiful, spirit, to love, to art, to nature. And we can have shrines all over the garden and the house, and they can be as big or as small as we want them to be. You can also have shrines that are dedicated to specific deities, for example. Maybe, um, maybe you, you're a, a young uh, woman and you're um, trying to get over the heartbreak of a man and uh, you put Kali's shrine up and you start to work with Kali's energy as, you know, like, help me, you know, a great mother. And it's was focusing on a specific deity. Or maybe you set up a shrine to Bridget, the, the goddess, the Irish goddess of healing and poetry and beauty and uh, all of these things. Um, or you create a shrine in your garden for the spirit of the land. This is something that I believe every one of us should do. If we, if we have a garden, and it can be pot plants, it can be land, it can be whatever, we should have a small or red <laughs> shrine to the spirit of the land. And that spirit of the land is the spirit that looks after your land. It was there, it's a spirit of your land. It was there long before you arrived, and it will be there long after you leave. And in every single home that I lived in growing up, we've always built a land shrine. And that land shrine usually was made of, um, it always differed. It could even be a little garden, but like a fairy garden or something. That's you. But my grandmother always had, um, and you'll see this a lot in Ireland. It's like, it's a piece of stone slab supported by two stone slabs like this a dolomite kind of like in stonehenge and that was very simple and you would look at it and, and nobody would know what that was but on top of it there was always every now and again just a bunch of flowers or under it a little bit of milk and honey and she always dug a well under it now as you say where where does the, how deep is the well and she said it has no bottom obviously did have a bottom because she dug it but you know to a kid that makes sense cool you know doesn't have a bottom and there was an old movie that i used to love watching called leaping leprechauns and they had one of the leprechauns to live down there so i would always just crawl up to the, in the fairy garden and listen for a long time to hear anything going on down there so Create so so you all you can you can all picture what I'm talking about. It was kind of like a, a beautiful stone slab and then it's supported at the bottom by like two other rocks or stone slabs. And she would be stand like a, a hole in the bottom there that would get milk and honey poured into it and planted around it with all kinds of beautiful flowers. So this could be an example of that you could also use if you've got land um a tree trunk from a tree that's been cut down and you could use that and paint it or put a flat slab of stone on it and use that as an altar or a shrine but it's important to honor that bird is really honoring the whole day it's been honoring <laughs> with that delightful um, I can't it's so important to honor the land and to speak to the land and say, hello, I'm Liz. I live here. <laughs> you know, I mean, hello. We just move in and we just take over and we just think we run the show. And then one of the first things I do when I go and do house cleansings for people, because like stuff, stuff goes on and people always resort to the exorcist. My house must be diseased, you know, or, you know, somebody's dead and floating around. Very often it's just land spirit that doesn't know who is this, what's going on here. And if you travel to countries like Bali and Thailand, there are land shrines everywhere. 
You arrive at a big mountain, there's a shrine for the mountain. You arrive at a waterfall or a lake, there's a shrine for the waterfall and the lake. And whenever people come, they'll put a coin there or a flower or a can of coke or whatever <laughs> to honor the land spirits. And when we collect produce, you know, we can leave a leaf on that shrine to say thank you. Then you can have a home shrine because your home has a spirit as well. And in our, the, the, the countries of our origins in Germany and England and Scotland and all over the show, we had the house brownies and the, the little gnomes that live in the house and the elves. Like the, remember the story about the elf and the shoemaker? You know, and at night they're supposed to come out and do the chores for you if you're well behaved. So in the corner of my kitchen, there's a little, a little house brownie thing that I sometimes just put a little bit of food there or a little bit of breadcrumbs or whatever. And that's just an honoring, they don't do the chores. <laughs> I've been trying so long. My house brownie is coming on Sunday, but she gets, <laughs> she gets paid differently. Yeah. Um, but we honor the spirit of the home as well. So in Italian witchcraft, you had the lare, the lare were the spirits of your home, and they were your ancestral spirits. And then you had the lasa, who were the, the wild spirits around in the garden, in the land of Himo. <laughs> <laughs> I know you, that's a nice. <laughs> So you had the, the Lhasa around in the land, and these were like kind of wild, because what is a garden? A garden is just a tame version of what was beyond there. You think of the old village. Just beyond the garden was the woods, the, 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 the further land, you know, the wild. Now we, we've lost that. We've lost so much of that connection to the wild. Everything is so horticultural and so agricultural. Um, that we lost the wild, like these stories of Red Riding Hood, you know, like going through the woods to be grand. Ah, cool. Now you're just going to get through the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> so, shrines. Oh, you, I can see all of your eyes are starting mm -hmm. to line up with where the shrines are going to, uh, going to be. And, you know, when you work with specific gods or goddesses, you can make a shrine to them. Yemen Java sits in the corner of my room there, and she's always got things going for her. I work with her a lot for my clients. So this one behind me is my ancestral space. It's more Sangoma related, and it's always changing and shifting. And this is where I work with my clients if I'm doing medicine work. So you can have pockets of magical spaces around. They don't take up lots of space. And the little shop could be a physical space. No, what are you thinking? Like just honoring it for being it. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. You know, you can you can when you when you start practicing magic, and you all are natural at this, it's just kind of the honing of it. When you walk into a park or a forest or you go hiking, you just there's a little buzz somewhere and you feel that this area in particular is not like any other. There's, there's, there's something here, there's something magical here. There's someone watching, or you know, there's a little pixie behind the, the, the tree, or whatever it is. You start to become really fine tuned to that. And this is this is this is where sacred place spaces are found in the earth, where our ancestors would then create points of contact between this and the spirit. And they would gravitate to those points. And very often there are areas where lines, literally the ley lines, intersect. And interestingly, now in Europe, they build churches on all of those points. Yes. All the pagan shrines, we have, we have, we still have documentation of folks sending out letters going, crush that shrine, that pagan place, and build a church there. And if you go to the really old ones, they still have the pagan altars in the church. The wells and the carvings and the stones and the green man faces because the people who built the churches were still old west so you see these non-christian images like still in um, rosalind chapel in scotland 
very pagan for those of you who've watched the uh, Vinci Code. So, connect to the land. The land is our temple. The land is our church as practitioners of the craft of religion and magic. We don't need buildings. We don't need temple spaces for it. We don't find Wiccan churches because of, we've got this in it. dome over it. We're in it. It wouldn't work. It would not work because by nature, people who gravitate to the spiritual path, they want to get their feet dirty and they want to be outside. They want the sun, moon, stars. This is who we are. Questions or thoughts on shine. What's your sacred space? It's a magical space. You can come up with another name for it if you want. I'm just teaching from what I know. But you can come up with your own space and name for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, your magical attic, <laughs> you know. So wherever we start to work, wherever we start to, wherever we revisit regularly and, and conduct magical or spiritual or energetic practices there, they're built up a force field. They're built up um, what is called a thought form or a, um, a something or that. Some kind of an echo, an echo build up over time. Now, if we go to Stonehenge, for example, mm -hmm. it's tangible because for thousands of years people have been going there and doing ceremonies. Still to this day, the druids are conducting ceremonies there on the soul. Um, in, but, but we've got sacred places here in South Africa that white people haven't been privy to. And, Thanks to the work of like Dean Leprini, who takes people up and shows us the Bushman caves and the sacred places around, we would never know. The cave is full of them. At Table Mountain, there's a book called, it's written by Dean Leprini called Pathways of the Sun. And it only explores the sacred places around Table Mountain. And there are figures in Table Mountain of Egyptian pharaohs carved into the rocks that have eyes that have the sun coming through them on certain days. There are wells there that the, that the Bushmen used to go and bathe women in for fertility. We've got one on Lawrenceford. There's a, there's a Bushman fertility well at Lawrenceford. Right up in the mountain, thankfully, I've been taken there to see it. And they found these leather pouches um, with ostrich egg beads inside and all of these things. And, uh, handprints on the walls and all of these images of fertility. But here, we've got such magic in our land. And the, 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 the teachings, the real deep teachings of, of witchcraft is in the mysteries of the land and the land that you live on. So there's this gravitation lately for people to you know, gravitate to European shamanism and Native American shamanism and Australian this and Buddhist that and yogic this. And this land carries an energy. It has ancestors. It has spirits. It has gods. And so do we because of our love. Yes. So the invitation as a practitioner of the old religion is to go and explicit to go and, and connect to your land, your land spirit. And this is where certain things cannot be, certain things can be taught, but certain things can only be experienced. Where you need to go and you need to talk to that spirit and interact with it directly and let it speak to you. No one can teach you how to do that. Only you must know how to do that. So the spirit of the sky, the spirit of the water, the spirit of the land, the spirit of the sea, the spirit of this, this bay over here, she's amazing. 
to come connect with her. She's very amazing. And this Halberg Mountain has a very, very powerful thought. And then you start by going, is this masculine or is it a feminine spirit? You know, what does it feel like to you? Does it feel antagonistic? Does it feel like it doesn't want people here? Because that can happen. You can go and you can say, hi, can I enter into this forest? And you just feel this, <clears throat> no. You go, thank you, I respect that, I honor you. Ah. You know, but yeah, we as humans just go, oh, I'm just going to go and build on it, wow, knock it all down. Um, mm -hmm. So there in, in Bali, Bali has a, such a beautiful way of interacting with the landscapes. Every architectural firm has a shamanic consultant who first will go and check if the land is okay with being built on. And if not, then offerings are given and a discussion and a negotiation <laughs> with the spirits of the land, because they believe that if you build there without that consent, the building will crumble, there'll be a fire, there'll be death, there'll be robberies, whatever it is. And so Bali is such a harmonious country because everything is built in line with things, like an older feng shui. So I hope that this is inspiring you for some shrine work and some land work. Because we can have all the ones and the tools and the books and the knives and the things that we want. But unless you can go and work with spirit yourself, you're missing out on the actual thing, the magic. And yeah. do you think it's like can sometimes come in arguments? Yes. Balance, what do you mean? What happened? No, well, because it's been driving me to Bitcoin every day. And I moved into the Newlands Forest and there was drive and that one where it came into Media forest has been in Canada and around. Do you talk? No, I'm saying. Do you know, like the top of the sun? Oh. See the forest there. Has my into the forest. Wow. First of all, I thought, anyway, am I the one who's in the tree? Did I put it again? Three times three. Three times three times three. They are massive. They are beautiful. They just. Made the assumption I was talking, I was taking mm -hmm. the beautiful scene there and to acknowledge them because it is magical. But then I was like, this is this wasn't your conversation, you didn't talk. Mm -hmm. And it's now a drop. Wow. Keep my mouth shut and my head shut around this one corner and another one. So there's a big one. Beautiful. Beautiful. So this, 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 this hand reach out from the other, from the other with a capital O, from the other realm, from the other world. I feel like the other is reaching out to, to human beings at the moment who can think, who can feel, who can, it could, could, you can light up in the spirit world. They know who you are. And because they're desperate for help yeah. as well. They're desperate to be seen. They're desperate. You see, my first craft teacher told me, she said, the fairy realm, the fairies, which are the spirits of nature, okay? And I don't mean just the tiny little wind to do. The spirits of nature, they are the guardians of the astral. And the witches and the medicine people and the shamans are the guardians of the physical. And our job is to maintain magic in both realms. But in order for that to happen, you have to have a working relationship with one another. So the, the medicine people have always had to have a working relationship with the spirit of the land. So that magic can flow into our world. If magic doesn't flow, all life will cease. And Another, another, another really powerful witch, an Italian Sprega that I know lives in Malmsbro. She, she always said that as long as one witch remains in the world to keep performing the sacred seasonal lights, the sun will rise and the moon will rise and the stars will shine and the tides will flow. But as soon as 
No one is left in the world to practice the old ways. Everything will stop. The sun will not rise again. The tides will dry up. And that is because we connect the spirit of nature to our humanity and to the land. There are deep mysteries there that we'll explore together one day. And, 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 and mysteries that I cannot even articulate, that you will have to be privy to from spirit directly. Because this is a shamanic tradition. And shamanism, someone says to me today, oh, my brother's gone on a shaman course. It's like, because you can't go on a shaman course. You can't go on a course for any of this stuff. You can go on a course, give, be given tools, learn some songs and how to wrap it up. But only the spirit world can initiate you. I'm very, very irreverent about this thing. I'm very flippant about it. But it's the truth. It is the truth. Nobody can teach us how to how to do this, this traumatic work. We can give you techniques, we can give you teachings, we can give you tools. But only you can go and stand like this under the light of the full moon, naked in a forest, and experience the voice of the goddess directly. Yeah. Or hear the voice of the spirit of the world. That is it. Does it excite you? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, so I just want to carry on. I don't know if you've heard of Michael Tillinger. Yes. Yeah. So he has done research into the the circles, the the, the um, South Africa. Yes. Yeah. So all those crazy circles. Um, and he also speaks about the cold and we've got amazing uh, a very long uh, documentary series on on those circles. I can actually share it on Please do. TV. So it's just one that I like to. Please do. Maybe put it on a different platform. Yeah. So um, that's very interesting. It'll be great. We've got that Google Drive. I'll share it with you all. I'll share it again just in case. And you guys are always welcome to add videos and content to that. that uh, and we will build our library on there over time. Um, but yes, go and, and go and talk to the local people who've lived here for a long time. Mm. You must understand that because of our bloodline, we bring with us our gods and our spirits. We carry with us our Celtic and our Germanic gods and our spirits because they, they travel with us. Just like the African gods and spirits traveled with the slaves over to America and they started hoodoo and voodoo and all of those things there, they travel with them. Ours came with us, but we are also still guests of the land. Whether we like that or not. Mm -hmm. You know, we're still guests of the land. The land or all land? Probably all land. Yeah. I don't I don't think because we're white we're guests of Africa. We came from Africa, all human beings did. You say. But um but we're all guests of the land. And and you know those of us who are you know privy to owning a house or owning a farm or a property or whatever. That's a temporary thing. That's not yours. It doesn't belong. That's why these land clashes are hysterical. Because human beings are just custodians and supposed to be guardians um, for a time. And so these mountains and these seas have lived here much longer than we have and will continue to. And so a spiritual rapport is important with the land. This is really what witches do. We go into forests and we bless them, and we go into rivers that have been polluted and we bless them, and we try and not only bless them, but just clean them. You know, we've got to be working with one hand in this world and one hand in the spirit. So it doesn't help to just go, oh, well, I'll pray for you. You know, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. Doesn't help. Yes, okay, maybe you can't do everything, but so so prayer is great. But go and fucking take a bag and pick up the litter on the beach. And then when you're done with that, then go and bless the water. We have to work with both hands, one in the world, one in the spirit world. So you'll very often find that witches tend 
who and meditative people I use it all interchangeably. Um, they often tend to work at animal shelters. You, you always see painters, yeah. <laughs> and um, and they'll always be involved in, in forestry projects, and they'll always be at the beach cleaning up something. And this is what's so hysterical is people say that we're so bad that we are always the ones raising money for the SDCA, doing a when the firemen are needing sandwiches. Some of the first people to run and help because witchcraft is about community, it's about the land, it's about the tribe. And we're not scared of fire. And we're not scared of fire. <laughs> no, not at all. We can go and work with that fire. So, so this is this is this is a thing, and, and, and it's been coming to me because I knew what we were going to talk about today, but last night when I was in here. And in my quiet place, and just connecting to spirit, and it just came to me, and 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 strongly this thing that just said this voice that just said, "Tell them they must always look at the moon. Tell them they must watch the stars. Tell them they must dig their hands in the soil. Tell them they must run into the cold water in the sea and in the water, because you are alive. This being human is such a gift." And our magic comes from nature. It doesn't come from us. We borrow it. We move it through us. Yeah. We talk about the meat side. The meat side. Yeah. But it you don't have the meat side. No. No, it doesn't come from, you know, this is just the conduit for it. So, what starts to happen later when we develop strong bonds with certain spiritual forces, certain spiritual entities? In our practice of the craft, they start to take on quite powerful guiding roles in your life. And they start to speak to you very powerfully in dreams and in visions. And they tell you what they need. And they ask you to help them in different ways. And you can ask them to help in different ways. It becomes a working relationship. So we're not arrogant enough to just stand there and go, hey, you gods. Come down here and help me out. No, it's about building a relationship. And so, as we build a relationship with our land, the land starts to support and nurture us in the most profound and beautiful ways. And, and, and it doesn't, you know, what Helium asked just now is so important because it doesn't have to be a tangible space, but it can. You can create a pot plant fairy garden, and that's your, or a pot plant just beautiful medicinal herb garden. And that's your shrine for the land that you live on. The land that you live on might be two by two meters. It's still the land you live on. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, 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 um, with, with some warmers, they always have snuff because snuff is tobacco. And everywhere, there's, you walk into a house, they kneel and sprinkle tobacco before they enter and ask the home if they can enter there. Ask the ancestors if they are welcome. Sometimes they take the head off the chicken as well. We've seen that in our, <laughs> in our own uh, <laughs> travels. But um, mm -hmm. so tobacco is, is, a, is an offering on the earth. And Native Americans use it as well. With water spirits, um, some gormas will always have what, what we call white man, silver corn. And if you walk across a sacred river or you go to the sea, you throw a coin in the water. That is your payment. That is your offering. So the, the offerings don't have to be there. They're symbolic. You know? And um, you won't believe what comes back at you to the tiny process. Tiny but significant. When the spirit starts to see that you see them, they get really excited. They get really excited. And you know, when I when when I grew up, I was I didn't have any friends my own age. I couldn't relate to kids my own age. I was mainly hanging out with adults or just by myself. But I never felt lonely because I had a strong connection to spirits. 
to fairies, to plants, to nature, to animals. So we never then feel alone. We never crave human company. And when, when my, my craft teacher, when you arrived there, she would take you by the hand because you hardly even mattered in that moment. And she said, I've got to introduce you to everybody. And then you get to, oh, shucks, who's there? And you don't meet one human being along the way. She had a sign on her gate saying, please come into my garden. My roses would like to meet you. And she would walk me through and she'd say, my God, this is Ryan. And Ryan, this is my God. And these are my roses. And aren't they lovely? Smell them. Tell them. Tell them how beautiful they are. They love a flattery. They love a compliment. <laughs> Look at them blush. Look at them blush when you tell them that. And I was like, who are you? I love it. I love this woman. And she said, stop. There's a frog crossing. You must get the right of way. And she was so in tune with her lap. I felt like I was like a major guest there in this frog in Jeff Rose Garden. Mm -hmm. That everything was allowed to live there. Everything. The ugliest cats, the, the gruesomest dogs. She would take them all in on the street. Mm -hmm. And so everyone would just be there. And you know, I'll share with you that, that place. I can't tell you. It was like it was in the middle of in a car cart. <laughs> but when you walked into her land, you I promise you went into a different dimension, you went into a different world. There were things growing to heights that you couldn't believe. There was this massive willow tree. There were things growing there that should not have been able to go there. There were animals living in the trees. Tame, tame. There was a squirrel that just came to live in her kitchen. Never left. Yeah. Never left. There were rabbits running through the house. She just had life there because she was so connected to her land. And so when I used to watch her intimate relationship to the spirit of everything, because she believed, and this is a very traditional witch perspective, everything has a spirit, everything. And she, if her toaster broke, she would crack him out. And she said, you're too young to die. Come on now. And she would, she would talk to everything like it was alive. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Can, I can, you know, people come to me and they tell me they're depressed. And I go, I can, I know why. We've lost so much of this. Country. We've lost so much. It's got nothing to do with this world. It has everything to do with sacred connection to the land. Go watch that movie, Brother Bear. You know that two different yeah. animations. Just as such a such a revelation. What's coming to you guys all while I'm talking about this? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Yes, you need a partner. You must dig one. <laughs> you must dig one, Papa. So it was a little bit of a divergence from all this and shrine, but not that much really. Okay, we will get majorly into this work later. So let's go back to the whiteboard because we have a syllabus. Right. Sometimes you've got the left brain has got to have a little change. <laughs> so the altars that I'm going to teach you about tonight, um, there are many different traditions in. In, in the craft. Um, and so you've got Germanic or Norse traditions, you know, that will work a lot more with the Viking kind of gods, and they'll have certain altar layouts. And their altar layouts will very much incorporate the runes, and there'll usually be a hammer on there for Thor, because their, their, their sacred space uses a hammer. And it's, very, it's a very beautiful tradition, it's quite masculine. Um, men, male pagans in, usually end up gravitating quite strongly to the Norse pantheon because they can stand there with a hammer in a circle and go, Hail Thor! Hallow the sacred space! <laughs> Get the log and move on, you know? It's very, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, very, it's very cool to drink from the Viking mead horn and uh, the whole thing. So, so that's, it's quite cool. It's, it's cool. cool. It's cool. It's a very beautiful, 
So they will often use these kind of symbolisms and they'll use fire and ice on their altars a lot because those are the primary elements of the North Pantheon. Um, in the uh, Egyptian altars, things will be a lot different. You'll see angs and images of Anubis and Isis and system rattles and things like that. And so, so there are many different flavors in the craft, many traditions that come through. The Italians do something, the Celtics do something. Um, so there's different expressions. My job is not to teach you all of that, it's to show you the, the general, and then you from there can go and explore and, uh, and play. So many traditions, but the Wiccan altar has a general framework, and I'll explain why that looks the way it does. Okay, so we've we've addressed a little bit about what is the function of uh, a shrine. We know what a shrine is for now, but what is the function of an altar? And and what was the difference again? You said yeah. So the altar is where you do your spell casting and work, yeah. like your dirty work, like your candles or yes. wands or your dirty work. Yeah. 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 The messy stuff. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yes, your altar is your altar is actually a working space. First and foremost. It is what we could think of as a sacred working space. So your shrine. Um Oh, do you know what? There is a little bit of cat hair in there. Mr. Uh, has no filter with fire and he just won't go in there. I think, like, next thing there's a whisker bar. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's a cat whisker, which is nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was a voluntary thing. Um, so, all right, so usually with shrines, they get a little bit messy and a little bit over the top. Um, shrines? Shrines. Oh. No, no, shrines. They, shrines tend to get, um, when I say messy, I mean, they get full statues and crystals and, and flowers and they, they can, shrines can be as over the top as you want them to be, as beautiful or as simple as you want them to be. But they're not practical for working spaces. Um, so that's where we honor and we appreciate and we love them. But an altar should actually have enough space for you to do your work, your workings. So if you're doing candle magic and you're carving or you're making oils or herb bundles, and uh, that is done at an altar. So that is a sacred working space. It usually has a lake um, paraphernalia and it's got your tools. And this is exactly what we call all of these goodies that you see on these altars. We call them the tools. We call them the working tools. So we'll start with, so, so think of an altar as the place that you do rituals and magic at, and it's a place that is functional. It has a function and it must be symbolic. But for, oh, it's taking it out. Um, so, an altar should be two things. It must A, be practical. An altar must be practical. So the first thing that people will normally say is, um, what direction must it face? Or must it be square or round or rectangular or oval? It doesn't matter. Hey, Liz? Functional. It must be practical. It also doesn't have to be up all the time. I don't keep my Wiccan altar up all the time. I used to, 
but I don't have space in this house to keep it up. And also I have clients and they would get a bit, I mean, that's usually enough. Um, so I put it out when I need it, I take it down when I don't. So you can decide your altar can be permanent or it can be temporary. It's nice to have a permanent altar. I like it, I prefer it. So I'm going, I'm converting a little nook in my bedroom. Um, but practical is the number one rule. Don't worry that you don't even have space in your home or your bedroom. My first altar was a, a biscuit pin with a, a handkerchief over it. And it worked very well for me for a long time. And in fact, I kept all my tools inside it. Yeah. And it's probably the best one I ever had, you know? So practical. Nice cookie jar, cloth. Inside there's your candles, your rope, your little bits of this and that. And uh, you've got it, and it's good, nice to travel with. Mm -hmm. Later, you can even have a nice something like that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, your sacred creations happen there. So, now if you have one of these, you can actually end up. Oh, it's my thing in the fridge. Um, I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's nothing bad. Yeah. Well, and he does, trust me. Yeah, yeah. So, um, biscuits and cookie dolls. Okay, so a box like that is great because you can then close the lid and actually use the top. And then when you finish, you can put all of your paraphernalia back inside. And that's that. Um, the most important thing about an altar, other than practical, is it must carry symbolism. Okay, so we never ever put onto an altar just stuff, mesua, because. Because it's pretty. That goes onto your shrine. If it's pretty and somebody gave it to you as a gift, it goes near your shrine. Oh, sorry. Another thing with your shrine is whenever you receive gifts, it can go there as your thank you to the bird. You know, so whenever uh, today somebody bought me some granadillas, um, somebody gave me a lot of money. Somebody gave me a ribbon from Ireland this week from St. Bridget's Well, these beautiful herbs. So every gift comes to the altar for a day or two, and it's just like a thank you. And then it can go into the home. Yeah, same. Or just even just like a little piece of it, just as a thank you, a little offering. I'm jumping, sorry, between altars and shrines. <laughs> The altar must have symbolism. And I'm going to teach you the Wiccan symbolism just to give you a framework to work from. And then from there, you can break the rules. Um, so, this altar over here that uh, I've put up for you, this, this one, is the, it's a non initiatory altar. So, this is a general. A general altar. And that one over there is a different story. I'll tell you about that. Um, right, I had a question if I wanted to begin. Um, so the, the the two candles and then a fire candle. Yes. Yes. So okay, so in our tradition, normally we try and position the altar in a direction for a specific purpose. So this is number one. 
The altar can be placed according to a direction. We can face it east, and that would symbolize what? You. Exactly. The start of things. So if we turn the altar to face east, we're probably doing work, rituals, spells, prayers, visualization, even goal setting. Yes. So when it faces east, uh, are you facing east or is it facing east? Yes. So you will face east okay. when, you, when you work at it. Yeah, good question. Um, but this, this is actually a good point when Sala brings up. We should know at all times where East, North, West, and South are in our home and in, in our internal compass. And Google also. And Google. <laughs> but I want you to I want you to not use your apps. <laughs> I want you to look. I want you guys to look at the sun. And I want you to look at the moon. And I want you to look around you and go, okay. The sun, it's, I mean, it's so simple. Sun is there, setting, west. The other arm is east, therefore I know that that's east, that's west, that's north, that's south, or the other way around. Okay. But when you start working with the land energy enough, I can promise you now you can walk anywhere. You can be hiking and someone say, I wonder where north is. Even at night, you'll just feel a gravitational pull towards the directions, especially when you work with sacred space. And, and the magical circle teaches you the different feel of the different directions. You are honing something inside of you that all of a sudden you'll just go, there's East. I, I know it because I have a relationship with that direction. I, I know the spirit of that direction. We're all things. It's very amazing. It's very, very powerful. Someone will say, I wonder what time of day it is. And you've got a relationship with the sun and you'll be able to sense. And even the phase of the moon. That, that is what I want you guys to be trained into. Not the books. Don't open up your diary and find out when the full moon date is. I want you to feel it. Feel it and gravitate it. Okay. So east would be for new beginnings. It's symbolic of air and the mind. And so we could we could face that direction in our work, or we could orientate our altar in that direction. Or we could even, if we just were doing prayers or devotions, just stand and face that direction. If these are the things that we want to bring into our lives. North, north is a very powerful direction for our tradition as the craft because even in the southern hemisphere if we look the, the reason for this this mystery if you look at a magnet what if you've got a magnet over here and here's the north pole and here's the south pole where does the end of the electromagnetic field come out of mm -hmm. The north, like that. Okay. Every magnet, every single magnet, the electromagnetic field comes out of the north and goes back into the south. Our planet is exactly the same. It's also a magnet. And the electromagnetic field comes out of the north and goes back into the south. So, when the old witch tradition said everything comes from the north, all power comes from the north, they meant it. So, for us, the north, we call it the point of power. The, the place that power emerges from. And for people of European descent, it is also a direction of your ancestors as well. So you can link that up symbolically to where, where we came from, which we as Caucasian people of European descent, we need to stop being ashamed of the fact that we are white. <laughs> okay. 
we can be completely pro every color, but we don't have to be ashamed of our origin either. We came from the north. We are the people of the north. Okay, so that's allowed. We're allowed to say that. There's a funny thing happening in the in the book. Sorry, just looking at drama queen now. We've now seen all the years. <laughs> So I'll, I'll protect your, your, your Okay. All right. Oh, my angel, Sabah said she'll protect the altar. Okay. He just wants to be with us. So we face the norms in the majority of our work because we believe a lot of the power comes from there. And it makes sense if you're working at night, usually the full moon sits right in the north. If you're doing full moon ceremony, she sits in the north. And she represents the fullness of power, the same as the sun in the middle of the day is in the north. Fullness. Yeah. What, what, what it also could represent is when you are looking for direction or to look into the or something. I love that. Uh, when you look at uh, the true north or, or the compass is where you're going to find the north. I love that, Major. I would never, I haven't thought of that before. That's a beautiful association put into that. So, if we're ever feeling lost in our lives, orientate the altar north, your northern star. Um, that's really beautiful. North in our tradition in the southern hemisphere is ruled by fire. And so, it's also got to do with passion and courage and love and all of those fire related. If we orientate our altars to the west, this has to do with the element of water. The season is autumn. Sorry, I should have told you the other two as well. Right? So somewhere... East is spring and air. Yeah. Yes, this is very important. You guys must know this off by heart. East is air and spring. Autumn. Yeah. 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 Autumn. Yeah.
This is also when the energy of the first two quadrants, which are very external, you know, when we're a child, when we're a young adult, it's about externalize, raise the family, do the school, have the career. But the last two quarters are internalizing. The energy moves inside. You're not so interested in that big rah-rah stuff. And you're more focused on your inner world, your internal experience. And yeah, what is? Yeah. So yeah. what is the focus on? What is what is the autumn different to the summer? How does it differ? Um, and I have more time for me. Yeah. I'm sort of coming to the end of my career, mm -hmm. looking at with excitement what I'm going to do and great mm -hmm. with raising the next generation yes. or that double down generation. You know, these, these mystical rites of passage we'll go into when we study the seasonal festivals. But you know that you've transitioned from there to there when you either have kids or you start buying your house or you start your business or you start studying, you know, you, you've got more independence. All of this is very dynamic energy, east and north. And then later on, you transition again. You now start getting grandkids. Your kids are now in their north. Isn't it beautiful? It's just... It's such a beautiful natural vibration. And I can see Ayurveda happening. Completely. 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 I would love you to do the teacher training again, now knowing yeah. Wicca, because you're going to be like, oh no, no, there's more, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes I have to hold back in the yoga yeah, training because I'm like, oh, yeah. there's so much similarities here. Like these two candles are either and Pingala. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I, I promise you, and Sushumna in the middle, you will see so many of these. So, <laughs> oh, I still, you'll be at the moment, it's not getting you too excited. <laughs> All right. So, West. And West, because it's associated with autumn, it's associated with if this was new beginnings in spring and that was abundant, what would autumn be energetically? Closure, settling, conclusions, harvest as well, yeah. reaping the rewards of hard work. Can you see how these things are not, they don't just exist on an altar in the sacred circle, but they exist in our lives. You know, what about you start a new business? That is symbolic of this Eastern energy and it grows into fruition. And then one day it gets beyond its date and you sell it off to somebody or it declines and you start a new one. You know, it's reached its closure, it's reached it. Everything in this universe works in cycles. Because we have that little cycle at my age in life as well. Yeah. Yes. Where? Starts a new business. Yes. Because, because within the circle, there are little orbits yes. as well. Later we'll learn or see, it just makes sense. This is a big circle we're talking about now is the sun. But around that, the moon dances. Mm -hmm. So even at Saba's age, she goes to beginnings, middles, and ends. Summers, autumns, and winters. Summers, autumns, and winters. Summers, autumns, and winters. And you're in an autumn in your life, and now you've got a gratitude, and now the energy of spring comes back to you. So many orbits. So the god and the goddess, symbolized by the sun and the moon, in our craft, they dance this beautiful dance. And we start, when we study these mysteries, we start to realize that there are longer cycles in our life, and there's also mini cycles in our life. But they always follow the same trajectory. They always follow the same thing. So stocks, you know, Bitcoin, it must rise, and it has to fall. It has to rise again. This is literally the law of nature. Even the tides of the sea reach a peak and a crest and a dip. Okay. So everything about the craft tunes us in. Not just intellectually, though, just viscerally. We then, I can promise you now with all of my heart, we can we start to be able to tune in 
to what part of my life this is coming to an end. So do you when um so the moon phase of the of the west? Yeah. Moon phase of the west, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um no, I mean, pause on that because yeah. I can tell you that. I can so we'll, we can go into it in the second round. I don't want to get too off okay. the, the track of altar. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're going to get into all of this in the um, in the sacred circle. Okay, so spring, new, fresh, young, innocent. What else? Air, air, light, laughter. Joy. So if, if you're studying for an exam, so the east is the direction that you want to work with because it has to do with your head, with exams. Okay. So whenever we do so, so in that Silver Ravenwolf book, she she'll teach you about those different directions. Um so that's that's waste, and I like what you said, um, Kilian, with closure and like settling in, settling in, very nice. Because isn't that what we start to do in autumn, like towards winter, we start to draw in and settle in. Um, yeah. So witches are very tuned into these cycles, and it also happens in our own home as well. When it's spring, we clean. When it's autumn, we start to hang up the heavies and close the curtains and the windows, and we start to internalize. But what I was saying was you will eventually become so attuned to these rhythms by the practice of the craft that you'll be, for instance, in a, let's say, let's say Mareka's uh, working in a company. And then one day she just feels it's reached the autumn, like we're almost done here. I can't tell you why, but it's not. I need, to move on. I need to move on. And so we start to internalize the external cycles. And, and then something even more profound happens later on. You are so tuned into the seasonal land that it will feel almost impossible for you to start a project in winter. Like it just doesn't feel ready to move. And then all of a sudden, as August and September approach, you'll feel the pressure thing in your fingertips you will get very tuned in to these cycles the south earth is old age old age and because it's the element of earth we use it for the we use it for earth related things such as Grounding, manifest your desires on the earth. So, therefore, a big one for stuff is money, money related things, abundance and prosperity um, related things, food, rest, house and home, land. So, the south. If you're feeling like you need routine and stability or structure, south is your direction to work with. All right. If you need, if you need energy, if you need courage and dynamism, north is a great one to work with. So the the, the, the place that you he is relentless with this table, isn't he? He never it's 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 just not old. Mm -hmm. Um so and then, so that's the directions that you could face your altar. It's not a rule, but it is nice. And if you've got space to do it, then go. Yeah. So the altar stays in the same place. It's just you. So so okay. So that's a great question. So let me let me. So this this altar right now for me is facing east. So the way it's oriented. If I turn it this way, it would be north. Oh, okay, so that's the top of the altar. All right, and I'm going to teach you how it's structured now, how it looks. So the altar is usually in the center of the circle that we work in. It doesn't have to be, but it usually is. 
practical space to put it. Um, okay, so that's 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 direction. Now you can have different colored plots on your altar that have different symbolisms as well. Everything is symbolic. Every single thing. That's what makes it an altar. Nothing is put on there next to it. So some simple colors that we'll look at, and there's so, so many colors in your books and things that you can find. But green, for instance, would represent what? Money. Money. Earth. 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 Abundance. Earth. Growth. Um, fertility. Yeah. Go. 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 Oh, by the way, that south was winter. Did I say that earlier? South. I said old age, but I didn't say winter. Um, go, yeah, go, nice, yeah, go like a robot. Yeah. Um, so it can it can represent many things. Green is a healing color. It is abundant. It's prosperous, and it was the only color that I had lying around when I was dedicated yeah, decorated. Yeah. Them. But for a general altar, white. Okay, white is a good general color, and it's the one that I would recommend that you all use at the beginning. Because white, why, why white? Clean, clean, purity added contains all the other colors. White contains all other colors in the light spectrum. So white is very good. You can't go wrong with white. I, when I work, um, most of my work, I use a white altar cloth. Because it means general working can be applied to every situation. All magic can be done with white. You could use other colors for other things, but we'll get into those sorts of things later. Um, you know, we're not, we're not going to go into it. But I would suggest that when you're building a working altar now, find a white cloth or black. Black is also a great and sacred color for altars. Why? What is black? Absence. The absence of everything. So it represents the void. It represents the cauldron from which everything can come from. Potential. Black is a great color. Black is a beautiful, because it's actually not a color, it's absence of color. And so it represents potentiality. It represents white is very much the color of the masculine force, the yang energy, the god energy. And in sexual lingo, the seminal fluid is white. Um, so it represents life, that life force. Black is very much associated with the yin energy and the goddess. And as such, it represents the womb and the tomb. So this is what the cauldron represents, the womb and the tomb. So the cauldron represents the belly of the great one. That's why we use a cauldron. It's the belly of the great mother. So, so black is, a, is, is more of a goddess color and it rules day or night. 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 And what, what, which sun or moon rules the night? Moon. moon. Okay, so now we're starting to see all the connections. So goddess, moon, goddess of the moon, night, black, Okay, yin, yang, the sun, the day. This is externalizing, this is internalizing. This is electro, this is magnetic. Yes? Those of you who've done the yoga courses, you're starting to see a picture of that. Ah, all sorts of things coming up. Okay. Electro. Um, um, electric energy is masculine and magnetic feminine. We must be careful not to use the labels of male and female because it's got nothing to do with polarity. A magnet is not male or female, it has polarity. And we have polarity. So we are striving for balance of our polarities. This is what yoga is doing, this is what hatha is doing, isn't it? The balance of high and tough. 
sun and moon. Witchcraft is no different. It's our it's our ancestral yoga. Don't tell anybody <laughs> in the yoga school. All right. <laughs> it's our ancestral yoga. So these two candles, we call them the illuminators. And they have a very practical as well as symbolic function. What do you think their practical function is? Illuminate. Illuminate. <laughs> Because if you're working outside at night under the full moon, y'all need to see what you're doing. So we have illuminators. And if you don't have a black and a white candle on your altar, what other colors can you use to represent these polarities? Yes. <laughs> But I'm looking specifically for the balance, the two opposites. What other color can you think colors? Mm -hmm. Balance them. One on one side, one on the other. Think sun and moon. Blue and pink. Even more. God and goddess. Pink and Think more silver. regal. Gold and silver. Gold and silver. Gold and silver. So silver would be this one over here for the moon, for the goddess, and gold for the god. Now we always place the god candle on the right. That is more of our either angular connections. And we always place the goddess candle on the left. Yogis, tell me why. Why is the goddess candle on the left? Tell us, Laura. Oh, because, okay, so the left side of the brain is logic, so it's masculine. The right side is feminine. And the two energies interweave through the chakras, and eventually they cross, they continue to cross with the chakra. Yeah. So, the right side of the body we associate with masculine energy because it is ruled by the left brain. Left brain is masculine related things. Okay. We will get deeper into this one then. Left, just take my word for it. Left side is the feminine related thing. The left side in yoga is either, so left, left nostril, right side, angular, masculine. Okay, these are balance of the solar and lunar planets. So on an altar, we also have those standing there. So that immediately when we stand in the middle, we represent what is being polarized. And we, regardless of your physical gender, we are remembering the polarity within our being, within ourselves. So gold and silver are also nice colors to use. Um, this is not a rule, but the symbolism is really strong. Other things that you can have on the altar are um, images of God and goddess as well. So I have here very Wiccan images of the goddess of the moon and the horned god of nature. And they represent these two beautiful polarities. He is the god of the sun and of, of the animals, and she's the goddess of the plant kingdom and the moon. And so we can place them, if you've got enough space on the altar, you can place images or representations. But you could have on this side, for instance, horns and a shell for the masculine and the feminine. Or you could have a white crystal and a black crystal. It doesn't have to be candles. Mm -hmm. So your illuminators might take on that, that, or you might just have two Kabuna pick and pay candles there, no problem. But always have something that represents these polarities on either side. And a 
black and um, a white stone will work perfectly. Yes, smoky quartz and get quartz, perfect, perfect. So then even if you don't have candles on your altar, you've always got a representation of the balance of the polarity of day and night. Sorry, why did you say the shell and? Yeah, that's, a, that's one that I saw a, um, a young, a young um, guy, a young teenage male we can he loved to use pieces of horn on his altar. And uh, yeah, cool, you know, great. So, uh, so that's the illuminators. Then in the middle, we usually have a representation of spirit, okay? This doesn't have to be a statue. It could be of either polarity. So on this altar, I put an image of the goddess for you. And on this altar, I put a picture of the god. Um, or you might have something else that is symbolic. You might just have a bunch of flowers. Okay, so something that represents spirit for you. Or if in that ritual you're working with a specific deity, let's say you're working specifically with Anubis or Yemaya, then you would put them in the middle because they are going to focus the mind. So then that would be the body. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Remember that there are no rules. But symbolism is important. So when you put an item on your altar, know why you're putting it there. That is where that's where the magic will come from. In our more traditional work, we often end up putting a cauldron there or a broom, because a beeson, a beeson, because the broom represents the, the masculine and the feminine. Quite crudely, the masculine, the feminine. Okay. Where did you get that mini one? Yeah. My mom bought it for me from her travels recently. It's amazing that I'm about to have a mini one. It's very cute. And I suggest you guys make one. Make a mini one. I'll make a few mini ones. We're going to keep you busy with orders. So this 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 broom can represent it was one of the it was one of the reasons which is used of broom um, was because it represents the god and the goddess united as one. Very united. Yeah. Super united. And in fact, in the Museum of Witchcraft um, in Cornwall, the top of the broom often has quite a phallic carving um, at the top. Probably used for recreational activities um, of sorts, which you'll learn about when you go into rooms one day. All right. So the the middle doesn't have to have anything, but it can have a representation of deity or spirit. Um, I often use this Mother Mary here as well for mine, but uh, you can really choose what you want. It doesn't have to. Now the important thing on your altars currently for your level of where you are now. So I'm going to tell you that this is an altar for initiates. For those people who initiate into the craft, this is what the coven altar is going to be like. And it's full of props, full of tools. And everything here is pretty much uh, a little bit of a bigger version of the solitary altar. So this, this, we call it the solitary altar because it's what you're using when you're practicing your own craft. But that would be for group work. Big, bigger things are happening there. Okay. So, but I, I'm just showing you the links. So the, the the very important thing that you have on your altar are a representation of the four elements. Four elements, very important. Now you've learned their directions. So. What I did yesterday, just for this altar to decorate it for you, I went to the crazy store and I bought four of these little glass jars. And these work perfectly to house each of the four elements. And they were like 10 bucks. <laughs> okay. So that was just for the display. But then again, it's not a rule. So air, we would put in the eastern direction. Now, regardless of where your altar is facing, Air always goes in the east. 
always. So if my holes are facing this way, then air will be there. If my holes are facing this way, then air will be there. If that way, then air will be there. But always align everything correctly. Sorry, the, the, the fan doesn't need to be current. Sorry, this is an intense current. <laughs> if you're wondering what it is, it's a little intense um, in this job. So things that you can represent air on your altar might be what? Mm -hmm. Intense. Feather. Feather. A nice one. Feather is actually a great one to have on your altar because it's a permanent representation of air. And then burn incense when you're doing your work. So I like to use this. Another thing for air? Yes. A picture. We did a job on like that. Yes. You know a, a child story about a little kid that went out and catch the wind in a jar. Yes. And she went to her grandmother and her grandmother and her grandmother and something like that. So, so maybe that's a new Wiccan tool that uh, we can add a little bottle of air inside it that has the mysterious voice of the wind. And I like that. Yeah. You can get the seat. <laughs> so other things uh, for the east for air could be a bell. Um, a bell is a, is a sound. Um, so those are kind of eastern things or images of birds, a statue of a bird. Uh, with a, you know, think fairy. Yes, fairies are uh, great for east imagery, the air. A butterfly. A butterfly. So wings. So so you see that you can make your altar in such a way that even if muggles walk into your house, they wouldn't. They might not even know. Yeah. It just looks like a beautiful table with gorgeous decor on it. Doesn't have to look a cult. All right. I like mine to look cult, <laughs> but it doesn't have to. To the north, always to the north, there is fire. Okay. So this, this candle is different to these candles. And usually it can be any color, but red is traditional for that, for if you're using a fire, uh, a fire candle. What would air be? Yellow. Yellow. Yeah. Fire red. So you could have a candle, but let's be creative. What else could you have in fire? No. North, <laughs> you know, what, what do we symbolize fire with? Not a candle. Um, uh, red, red, yeah, so like a bottle of red ink or red food dye. No, red wine. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. A red crystal, yes, so like a nice jack bell or a garnet would look gorgeous. What else? A match or lighter. A match, yes, exactly. A match or a lighter. And um, I. Hmm? Red wood, beautiful. I've also seen pieces of volcanic rock. That's nice. People have used volcanic rock. Um, yeah, so there's some fire things. A, a, another friend of mine used to use ginger, fresh piece of ginger mm. to represent Chili. fire. Pretty. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited that you guys are thinking symbolism mm. now and the fun stuff behind <laughs> it. Okay. Um, Water is water. <laughs> water is symbolized by water, and it's in the west, and the color is blue. Check for Helen and Bev are still here. They're still here. Um, it's symbolized by blue. So other than the water, not just I mean, other than water, what else could we do? A shell. Wood. Yeah. Coral. I've got a shell here. Mm -hmm. Coral. I would like to deter people away from supporting these uh, chain manufacturing shell shops um, that sometimes kind of take from the sea. So go and find your own shop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't please don't go and buy starfish at a shop because people are having to kill starfish to get a starfish for you. So go and find a shell rather. Go down to the sea and ask the goddess to bring you a shell. That's much more exciting than going and buying one at a shop. Um, what other things, driftwood, somebody said, what else could we use to symbolize water? So if you could find one of those, that'd be great. 
or even a blue crystal. A rock that floats in the water. That's incredible. That's incredible. What about pearl? Yeah. You're going to say pearl. Yeah. What else? A little mermaid. It's a <laughs> yes. Don't neglect animal figures. Like fire could be a dragon, you know, um, or any other animal that doesn't bite. A lion, maybe a lion could be good for fire. A fish. So there's plenty that we can do in the water. And on the later on, the chalice is symbolic of water element and the goddess. Whereas in air is symbolized by the wand and fire by the acrobate. Um, good. Then finally, the last of the elements on the altar, earth. Normally, we use salt because we like to sprinkle salt around for protection and purification. Um, and then we could run on a whole list of symbolism there. You could use a rock, you could use sand, you could use soil, you could use some green, um, an mm -hmm. elephant. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Herbs, fresh herbs, tobacco. tobacco, good. So, and that's in the south, and that's green. So, what I want you guys to do now, yes, there can be a symbol in the middle, and most people like to use the pentagram um, for the because it represents, and we're not going to go into it now, so it represents the bringing together of all of the elements. Including the fifth element, which is spirit. Okay, so it represents the unity of earth, air, fire, and water, the spirit at the top, all encapsulated in the circle of life in the room of the gods. So, this is why people, this is why witches will use the symbol in the middle because we believe that it pulls the elements together and focuses them in the middle of the altar. Yeah. Doesn't have to, you don't have to use it. Um, what are you going to ask? Um, you say about the element. Yeah. Spirit. Spirit. Yes. Okay. And um, then on that point, does the, the seasonal stuff remain where they are? Always. You don't Spirit let them do that. Nice. No. Spirit in the circle is in the middle. Uh, in, yeah, spirit is, is symbolized by the middle of the altar. Good, uh, good question. So spirit is in the middle of the altar. So we put, and I would suggest with all of your tools, go and make your tools, or get a young green witch. <laughs> um, <laughs> to make some magic. <laughs> Be careful what you wish. Um, this, this I made, Lord knows when I was probably about 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's a, literally a cracked piece of wood that I found, a horrible bent buckled piece of wood. And my mom's Mod Podge from her decoupage set. That was it. And these were from gift wrapping paper that I cut out. And this I managed to draw and hand cut out. By myself, I mean, it's just it's very wonky, but and then Mod Podge over with Deck Podge. And this means more to me than any scoreboard pentacle can because I made it. Remember, this is a craft, hence the craft. So, yeah, you get these people and they jump on the bandwagon and they go and order all of these fun things on eBay, but it's not yours. Nothing can be as powerful as yours. And this one over here, I made with clay. Air dry clay, and um, that I bought at the craft shop, and I just rolled it out with a rolling pin, and I flattened it, and I used a, a knife or something, a ruler, to make the lines. Okay, don't worry about those symbols for now; they're for later. But for now, you can just make a clean one if you want. If you don't want any symbols, that's also fine. Yeah, of course. You can. Yeah, paint one, draw one, and um, be creative. Instead of that, instead of that, I would use a second close to that would be a triangle, because the triangle represents 
An upward point represents the God energy and manifestation. And if the point is down, it represents the God energy. So a triangle is a nice one. Other symbols that people use are a spiral. Infinity. 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 Exactly, because the spiral can also represent the pulling in of the elements. And then another one that people don't give enough attention to is the equal armed cross. Mm -hmm. Plus. Yes. Plus. Just a plus. Equal armed cross, because that represents the elements all in balance together. So, as I say, you don't need a central symbol. But again, if you want one, put it there for a reason. Make sure that you have a reason to, to work with it. Otherwise, just leave it empty because it can represent space, which is the fifth element, spirit, space, okay, potential. Um, one more thing that I want you to all go and purchase because we're going to end up using them today. Uh, where's my tape measure? Who feels like measuring? Can you measure how long it is? Um, I want you guys to go, and this is one of the only things that you're going to want to purchase, is white cord, like that. It, at the moment, 23 rand a meter. I was there yesterday <laughs> buying oh, buying yeah. the red with my red one wherever it is. Fabrics. Yeah, just at the Fogona fabric shop. And um, they always sell them. And this one is it's a certain length. Um So eventually, so, so go and buy five meters because they will cut it at the right length. It's actually got to be measured to certain lengths for your body. Right? Yeah, eventually it has your body measurements. But if, what this is going to eventually form is your solitary circle, which you will then start to practice certain techniques in that I'm going to be doing later on. Okay, so. You can use this for and those, it, hmm? and it must be white. It's white. It must be white. Oh. Traditionally, it was always silk, um, because silk is believed to no bad spirits can cross over silk. Um, and that's why often people wrap their tarot cards in silk and things, because no negative energy can touch them. <laughs> No, no. no. Your robes could be in silk. I mean, yeah, they can. Yeah. But, yeah. but I, I don't know what that is. I probably it's something. But uh, if you can find, if you can find something at the moment, the color is the most important for where you are at, and um, yeah. So that's all I want you to do in the meantime at home. Go and build an altar. Go and find a beautiful cloth or make one. Find your elements and your illuminators or symbols of the god and the goddess, pictures or some colors. And if you want a central symbol or you don't have to have one. And practice building it and seeing what it looks like in different directions, rearranging the elements, just have fun. Just have fun with it. And then keep your cord until near in the future. You can keep it by all also as well. So it's not all that easy. Which you can put it back on there now.
Okay, Whew. how are we all feeling? Are we psyched for all to try? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite understand the difference until no. uh, and then I just have a bunch of slides all around. Yeah. Trying to harness the. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, at an altar, you know, without, if I didn't have the cord here and the crystal and the feather and the shell, um, I would end up having a lot more working space. Yeah, you know, to to do my working at. Like, what do you need to do? It depends. It's a little bit. The mm -hmm. um, Later on, you you can see that in coven working, it gets very elaborate, quite beautiful and intricate. But the symbolism stays exactly the same. So my brother, sorry to interrupt you. My brother said it's easy. Yeah, it can be. Not to restart it. No, it can be. I used to end up keeping my books of shadows under. Under, yeah. Yeah. So normally, under here, I would keep the biscuit tin or the cookie jar, mm -hmm. um, and there's like a little shelf or something. Okay. And you can pile like your light uh, and like some things that you don't. So the um, paraphernalia goes under, or you could just have a little boxy or something next to you. So number one, it must be practical. It's a working space. Next time, I'll teach you how to then bless the altar and devote the altar. But for now, I want you to get it all together. Can you let me do this? <laughs> <laughs> so I've made it now on my head. And then, put it on morning when I wake up. Do you remember that prayer that I gave you last time uh, with the candle? And it said, uh, no, it was the, the goddess and the god devotion. Mm -hmm. I want you to do that daily. Mm -hmm. Light a candle at the center of the altar mm -hmm. and say that devotion daily mm -hmm. because it's, you could be doing it. I, um, I, I'm not much of a liar. I don't know. You can, sit <laughs> at the, you can sit at the altar and chant, you can meditate there, um, you can do whatever you want. but. Really, what I want you to do is I just want you to connect with it. I want you to connect to your altar and sit there and meditate on the symbolism. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Don't do anything. Okay. Sit. And I want you to start to, like, for instance, the black and white candles. There is a ton of symbolism in there. And then ask yourself, why the left? Why the right? Why these colors? What do the elements mean? Which, which elements are hot? Which are cold? Which are... You know, and just meditate on the symbolism because part of the mysteries inside the craft is what comes to you while you're contemplating the symbol. That's the magic. So, would it be maybe a good idea to sit and uh, kind of journal? Journal. Yeah. Yes. Draw pictures, <laughs> take these correspondences that we've learned about youth and age and. Uh, Ah, 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 yes, mm, mm, delicious. Okay. <laughs> yeah. like a little study nook. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. The rule with your altar and your shrine is that once it's been dedicated and blessed, it's preferable that nobody touches it. Okay. Other than you, kids are fine. Kids and animals, <laughs> kids and animals are fine. Kids and animals are fine. Um, mm -hmm. I usually find maids don't carry much of a negative energy. <laughs> no, I told them. Mine are usually terrified to touch mine. No, it's actually, I tried to take them. Not touch it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
like a magnet. Yeah. They will fly to that and go, oh, what's this? Mm -hmm. um, so they are, and you know, no, nothing's going to explode, no one's going to burn in hell. Um, <laughs> well, there's that one. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that. But really, it's your sacred space, and we should have something that's our sacred space. And it's good to teach your kids and your family that they're also allowed to have sacred space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's nice that the, you can have a big family altar as well, a family shrine, mm -hmm. one that everybody contributes to, like you guys have mm -hmm. with your kids. Mm -hmm. Our house is going to have like a round table and we're going to make that all Beautiful. Yes. Yes. So family altars are great, but always have a personal one, no matter how big, no matter how small. Um, you can, if you're feeling brave, have an altar in a little bag. You can carry a little altar in the bag. And that's another fun craft project. In Italian witchcraft, they call it a nanta bag. And a nunta bag has all of this in it, but for fire, they'll have a match and a little shovel and a stone or a bottle of salt and uh, a feather or a pin to represent the fame of the atom. And, um, and they'll have a little altar, a little candle representation of everything there. So that when you travel, you can open your nunta bag and you can pull everything out. <laughs> there is your altar. When, um, when we travel, we're going to do that. Yes, so, have magic, we'll travel. <laughs> so I want you to all make a little altar bag. You have a little Ouija board on, yes. uh, on Emirates. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's do something I had forgotten that. Yeah, I've forgotten about those. Like, do you want, what's it called? And in, in Italian, which called, they call it a nanta bag, N A N T A. But you could call it a, an altar bag or a charm bag or whatever bag. <laughs> Felix <laughs> the cat's bag. <laughs> You'll be amazed at what goes into there because eventually you'll have like a little horseshoe and like a magic dice and a lucky 40 clover and everything that you feel is important in your life goes in there. A little bit of tobacco as an offering or a silver coin for the water spirit, and you'll start to have this like bag. Yeah, and you can even make a little pentacle on like a little coin or a little piece of clay or something and put it in there. So have an altar bag. Do you have an altar bag? I do, but it's in the tongue. Like a little bag. <laughs> like, yeah, like your witchy fanny bag. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. How are you all feeling? Good? Yeah. Inspired. Sorry we took you over, Jules. I know you had a long day as well. But uh, this was a great thing for us all to go to. Yeah, the Turkish Gemini East. <laughs> 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 <laughs>